Alright, well, this is the conclusion of The Origin of Capitalism, A Longer View by Ellen Mason's Wood. Um, this is my third reading of the evening. And uh, I'm going to finish this book and put it on the YouTube for everyone to listen to and hopefully get something out of it. Because I started reading a lot more, getting way more involved in Marxian theory probably about two years ago. And when I first started doing that, the two books that really struck me, well, among others, and there's been books I read before going on this two-year long kick, was The Origin of Capitalism by Ellen Mason's Wood. Um, and, uh, Mihail Heinrich's introduction to the three volumes of Marx's Capital. And these books are pretty short, and I know not everybody really has time or the energy or the focus to sit down and read these books, but I don't think that should keep anybody from uh, getting the information that's inside of them just because they don't, uh, they can't read the books for whatever reason. So, um, I don't know why I'm getting this rambling uh, forward, but I uh, hope you liked listening to this. And thanks to everybody who leaves a like or a comment or whatever. It's, it makes me feel uh, good to know that something I like is uh, being appreciated by other people as well. So, thank you. Anyway, The Origin of Capitalism by Ellen Makesons Wood. Conclusion. This book has been about the origin of capitalism. What does that theory tell us about the nature of the system itself? First, it reminds us that capitalism is not a natural and inevitable consequence of human nature or of the age-old social tendency to, quote, truck, barter, and exchange, end quote, Adam Smith. It is a late and localized product of very specific historical conditions. The expansionary drive of capitalism, reaching a point of virtual universality today, is not the consequence of its conformity to human nature or to some transhistoric law or of some racial or cultural superiority of the West, but the product of its own historically specific internal laws of motion its unique capacity, as well as its unique need for constant self-expansion. Those laws of motion required vast social transformations and upheavals to set them in train. They required a transformation in the human metabolism with nature in the provision of life's basic necessities. Second, capitalism has, from the beginning, been a deeply contradictory force. The very least that can be said is that the capitalist system's unique capacity and need for self-sustaining growth has never been incompatible with regular stagnation and economic downturns. On the contrary, the very same logic that drives the system forward makes it inevitably susceptible to economic instabilities, which require constant extra-economic interventions if not to control them, then at least to compensate for their destructive effects. But the system's contradictions have always gone far beyond the vagaries of economic cycles. We need only consider the most obvious effects of English agrarian capitalism, that the conditions for material prosperity existed in early modern England in historically unprecedented ways, yet those conditions were achieved at the cost of widespread dispossession and intense exploitation. These new conditions also establish the foundation and seeds for new and more effective forms of colonial expansion and imperialism in search of new markets, labor forces, and resources. Then there are the corollaries of improvement, productivity, and the ability to feed a vast population set against the subordination of all other considerations to the imperatives of profit. This means, among other things, that people who could be fed are often left who could be fed are often left to starve.
there is in general a great disparity between the productive capacities of capitalism and the quality of life it delivers. The ethic of improvement, in its original sense in which production is inseparable from profit, is also the ethic of exploitation, poverty, and homelessness. Irresponsible land use and environmental destruction are also consequences of the ethic of productivity for profit, as we have seen most dramatically in recent agricultural scandals. Capitalism was born at the very core of human life, in the interaction with nature on which life itself depends, and the transformation of that interaction by agrarian capitalism revealed the inherently destructive impulses of a system in which the very fundamentals of existence are subjected to the requirements of profit. In other words, the origin of capitalism revealed the essential secret of capitalism. The expansion of capitalist imperatives throughout the world was regularly re has regularly reproduced effects that it had at the beginning within its country of origin. Dispossession, extinction of customary property rights, the imposition of market imperatives, and environmental destruction. These processes have extended their reach from the relations between exploiting and exploited classes to the relation between imperialist and subordinate countries. But if the destructive effects of capitalism have constantly reproduced themselves, its positive effects have not been nearly as consistent since the system's moment of origin. Once capitalism was established in one country, once it began to impose its imperatives on the rest of Europe, and ultimately the whole world, its development in other places could never follow the same course as it had in its place of origin. The existence of one capitalist society therefore transformed all others and the subsequent expansion of capitalist imperatives constantly changed the conditions of economic development. There is also a more general lesson to be drawn from the experience of English agrarian capitalism. Once market imperatives set the terms of social reproduction, all economic actors, both appropriators and producers, even if they remain in possession or indeed outright ownership of the means of production, are subject to the demands of competition, increasing productivity, capital accumulation, and the intense exploitation of labor. For that matter, even the absence of a division between appropriators and producers is no guarantee of immunity. Once the market is established as an economic discipline or regulator, once economic actors become market dependent for the conditions of their own reproduction, even workers who own the means of production individually or collectively, will be obliged to respond to the market's imperatives, to compete and accumulate, to let uncompetitive enterprises and their workers go to the wall and to exploit themselves. The history of agrarian capitalism, everything that followed from it, should make it clear that whatever, wherever market imperatives regulate the economy and govern social reproduction, there will be no escape from exploitation. There can, in other words, be no such thing as a truly social or democratic market, let alone a market socialism. I vividly remember, though the historic days of the communist collapse now seem very distant, how idealistic Democrats in the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe responded to warnings about the market from the Western left at a time when there still seemed to be an anti-market left in the West and still some chance for dialogue between that left and more progressive forces in former communist countries. When people warned that the market means not only supermarkets with vast quantities and varieties of super consumer goods, but also unemployment, poverty, environmental destruction, the degradation of public services and culture, the reply would be, quote, yes, of course, but that's not what we mean by the market, end quote. The idea was that you could pick and choose what you wanted from the self-regulating market. The market can act as a regulator of the economy just enough to guarantee some rationality, some correspondence between what people want and what is produced. The market can act as a signal, a source of information, a form of communication between consumers and producers, and it can guarantee that useless or inefficient enterprises will shape up or be winnowed out. But we can dispense with its nastier side.
All this no doubt seems as naive to many Russians and Eastern Europeans now as it did to some Western Marxists then. But the irony is that many on the Western left today are inclined to think that the market as an economic regulator is amenable to choice between its beneficent disciplines and its more destructive consequences. It is difficult to explain in any other way the notion of, quote, market socialism, that contradiction in terms, or even the less utopian conception of, quote, the social market, in which the market's ravages can be controlled by state regulation and an enhancement of social rights. This is not to say that a social market wouldn't be no better than unchecked free market capitalism. Nor does it mean that some institutions and practices associated with the market could not be adopted or adapted to a socialist economy. But we cannot refuse to confront the implications of the one irreducible condition without which the market cannot act as an economic discipline. The market dependence of direct producers, and specifically its most extreme form, the commodification of labor power, a condition that places the strictest limits on the socialization of the market, and its capacity to assume a human face. No one will deny that capitalism has brought with it historically unprecedented material advances. But today it is more obvious that, than ever that the imperatives of the market will not allow capital to prosper without depressing the conditions of great multitudes of people and degrading the environment throughout the world. We have now reached the point where the destructive effects of capitalism are outstripping its material gains. No developing economy setting out of the capitalist road today, for example, is likely to achieve even the contradictory development that England underwent. With the pressure of competition, accumulation, and exploitation imposed by more developed capitalist economies and with the inevitable crisis of overcapacity engendered by capitalist competition, the attempts to achieve material prosperity according to capitalist principles is increasingly likely to bring with it the negative side of the capitalist contradiction. Its dispossession and destruction, more than its material benefits, certainly for the vast majority, there is, if anything, a growing disparity between the material capacities created by capitalism and the quality of life it can deliver. This is visible not only in the growing gap between rich and poor, but also, for instance, in the deterioration of the public services in the very countries, such as the U.S. and U.K., where the principles of the capitalist market are most uninhibited. It is true that parts of the continent of Europe enjoy better public services, to say nothing of their often more congenial urban environments, but these advantages, which are in any case at growing risk, owe far more to the legacy of absolutism or to pre-capitalist borough cultures than to the logic of capitalism. Capitalism is also incapable of promoting sustainable development, not because it encourages technological advances that are capable of straining the Earth's resources, but because the purpose of capitalist production is exchange value, not use value, profit, not people. This produces, on the one hand, massive waste, and, on the other, inadequate provision of basic necessities such as affordable housing. Capitalism can certainly produce and even profit from energy-efficient technologies, but its own inherent logic systematically prohibits their sustainable utilization. Just as the requirements of profit and capital accumulation inevitably drive production beyond consumption and beyond the limits of use, they also compel destruction long before the possibilities of use are exhausted. Whatever capitalism may do to enable the efficient use of resources, its own imperatives will always derive it further. Without constantly breaching the limits of conservation, without constantly moving forward the boundaries of waste and destruction, there can be no capital accumulation. As capitalism spreads more widely and penetrates more deeply into every aspect of social life and the natural environment, its contradictions are increasingly escaping all our efforts to control them. The hope of achieving a humane, truly democratic, and ecologically sustainable capitalism is becoming transparently unrealistic. But although that alternative is unavailable, there remains the real alternative, um, alternative 
Man, I should read the last sentence of the fucking book <laughs> with a little grace. But although the alternate that'll the <laughs> the hope of achieving a humane, truly democratic, and ecologically sustainable capitalism is becoming transparently unrealistic. But although the alternative that alternative Jesus Christ, I'm crazy. But although that alternative is unavailable. There remains the real alternative of socialism. <sighs> Thanks for listening, everybody. That is the last chapter of The Origin of Capitalism, A Longer View by Ellen Mason's Wood. I don't know what I'm going to read next.